Dean, thank you very much for that uh, uh, introduction to what is going to be a superb run-through of Supreme Court activity both last term uh, and uh, this term. Uh, I'm John Cruden, the president of the Environmental Law Institute, and I want to welcome not only the people that are in the classroom, but for those of you here, we have a substantial number of people uh, uh, that are watching this uh, by computer. Uh, we have a webinar going on, so the slides and questions that will ultimately come in are questions of both the audience, uh, but for those of you who are watching this by your computer, you too uh, get to ask uh, uh, questions. If this is not showing, write down this email address, els at mail.law.harvard.edu. That's ELS at mail.law.harvard.edu because you too can ask questions. Our intent is to go uh, and talk about both of these terms and at the end we'll give a chance uh, for you all to ask uh, uh, questions and, and the same opportunity uh, for uh, uh, those people who are watching us uh, in their offices. I cannot resist pointing out that we also have in the audience not only John Leshy, a former solicitor of the Department of Interior, uh, but our good friend, my good friend, Wendy Jacobs, who heads the wonderful environmental law clinic here uh, uh, at Harvard. And for those of you watching by uh, your computer, we have a room full of extraordinarily uh, uh, talented uh, uh, individuals. Um, this is, in fact, now the Supreme Court review. The three people that we have to talk about it make this uh, the rough equivalent of a basketball dream team. Uh, uh, representing, I would point out, both Harvard and uh, 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 Yale. To my right is uh, uh, Jody Friedman, uh, who as everybody here knows, but for the purposes of those people who are not here, uh, um, but are in fact watching us via TV or computer, she is the Archibald Cox Professor of Law and founder uh, of the Harvard Law School's Environmental Law and Policy program. Several years ago, I was the chair of the environmental in, uh, uh, section of the American Bar Association, and we are having our annual conference, a very big deal, a lot of people come, and I was scouring the nation, talking to professors as to who should be our lead person, uh, uh, talking about climate change. It was without question, uh, unanimous there, uh, uh, to try to get Jody Freeman, who was then in the White House. Uh, uh, Jody was a counselor on energy and climate, uh, uh, where in fact she did a number of things, uh, where I uh, think of her most though, uh, is the extraordinary role she had in the historic uh, automobile agreement, which set really the first greenhouse gas standards for automobiles, but also uh, substantially made more strict the fuel economy uh, uh, standards. Jody's a prolific author, a leading scholar, uh, and a highly sought after uh, uh, speaker. To her right is uh, uh, Don Elliott, who's currently the chair of the worldwide practice of both environment, health, and the safety department of one of our leading law firms in the nation, Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. Um, but we know him best uh, for over 30 years of being a professor and then a chaired professor uh, at Yale where he has affected and taught countless uh, students uh, across the years. But he is not only a scholar, he is not only uh, uh, someone who has written uh, a lot, he is also a practitioner of environmental issues for several years, 1989 to 1991, Don was the general counsel of the Environmental uh, uh, Protection Agency, and in that position, he had a substantial hand in both drafting and implementing probably one of our most significant statutes, the Clean Air Act, uh, those amendments of 1990, and he was really on the ground floor uh, of that. But he's also litigated cases, and he's counseled companies across the world, uh, and I would have to point out, because it's important to me, uh, that he's also uh, on the board of directors of the Environmental Law Institute. And then to my left is uh, uh, Richard Lazarus, which the Dean has already pointed out is a new arrival here as the Howard and Kathleen Abel uh, 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 Professor of Law. Uh, he has arrived from uh, Georgetown, but he cut his teeth at the Department of Justice uh, where I was for many years. He was uh, in the Environment Division there and then the Solicitor General's office uh, with over 40, 40 Supreme Court cases 
and 13 oral arguments before the Supreme Court. Richard Lazarus is one of the foremost practitioners, commenters, thinkers about the Supreme Court in the nation. In his free time, uh, he was the executive director of the President's National Commission on Gulf Oil uh, Disaster, and he was the primary author of that report. I was still at Department of Justice at that time. I was leading the Gulf effort uh, on the litigation against the various companies. We read with interest uh, a book that came in on time and under budget. Uh, 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 not well-known things uh, in the federal government. Maybe one of the reasons uh, uh, that it turned out so well is that as executive director and primary author of the report, he brought in Jody Freeman. Uh, as a consular uh, uh, to that extremely important uh, uh, task force. So Jody, let's start out. Let's deal with last term, which is with probably the most significant uh, uh, term, certainly the most significant greenhouse gas case uh, uh, since Massachusetts versus uh, uh, EPA, the AEP decision. Tell us about it. So as John said, uh, AEP versus Connecticut is undoubtedly the most significant environmental law case uh, since Massachusetts EPA, I think, and uh, certainly of the last term. This is a case in which the court reversed the Second Circuit and held that the Clean Air Act displaces federal common law nuisance claims for harms caused by global warming. The headline on this case uh, might be, uh, at least from the environmental the plaintiff's perspective, it could have been worse. Uh, the decision is as significant for what it did not do as for what it did do. And I hope we can talk about that more in our uh, panel discussion. Uh, but to make sure we understand the holding, the court addressed three questions, whether the plaintiffs, in this case a combination of states, a municipality, and some private land trusts had standing to bring federal common law public nuisance claims against five major GHG emitting power companies. The second question, whether such claims were justiciable or whether they were not justiciable because they present a political question. And third, whether the Clean Air Act displaces uh, federal common law claims. The Second Circuit uh, had uh, held that the plaintiffs did have standing, that the political question doctrine did not bar the federal common law claims, and that the Clean Air Act did not displace these, uh, the nuisance claims, because EPA had not, by the time the Second Circuit rendered its decision, had not finalized any greenhouse gas regulation uh, under the Clean Air Act. The Supreme Court, unanimously, with Justice Sotomayor recused, and we'll comment on that in a moment, 8-0 uh, uh, decided that the Clean Air Act does displace uh, federal common law nuisance claims, and an evenly split court, 4-4, uh, affirmed the exercise of jurisdiction by the Second Circuit, finding that at least some of the plaintiffs had standing. So that affirmed the Second Circuit without creating a precedent uh, for other circuits. Uh, but what's significant is that the 8-0 finding, 8-0 holding for uh, displacement, uh, and the opinion was authored by Justice Ginsburg. Uh, first of all, just a note on Justice Sotomayor being recused, and others may wish to chime in on this. Then Judge Sotomayor heard, was on the panel of the Second Circuit that heard oral argument in AEP. She was, as Richard reminded me yesterday, we went over the uh, oral argument. She was extremely active on that panel and dominated uh, questioning from the bench. Uh, and we can talk more about the nature of her questioning, but it was clear she was very involved in uh, this case. But she was nominated to the Supreme Court before the Second Circuit handed down its decision. She was nominated in the summer of uh, 2009, went through the confirmation process, and the Second Circuit decision in AEP came down after she was confirmed in September. So she did not take part in that decision, and she recused herself uh, from the Supreme Court uh, decision. A uh, couple of interesting features of this case. First of all, the CERT grant, and secondly, the Solicitor General's intervention in the case. Then I'll talk a little bit about oral argument uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, some of the interesting implications. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the background of the case, the basis for cert. Uh, some folks thought there were good reasons that the Supreme Court wouldn't, uh, for denying cert. One is that, you know, there was not a split among uh, the courts of appeal 
uh, on these questions. And two is that the case was an interlocutory posture, uh, itself a basis for denying cert. But in the end, it was not that surprising, uh, I think, to most of us that the Supreme Court did grant cert. Uh, public nuisance, federal common law claims in public nuisance were percolating up from uh, uh, in a variety of circuits, the second, the fifth, the ninth. Uh, if you recall, the Kivalina case, uh, uh, the suit brought by the Alaskan village seeking relocation costs from uh, the big uh, energy uh, and power companies and oil companies for harms caused uh, as a result of climate change. This was dismissed on political questions ground and for lack of standing, but it was on appeal at the time to the Ninth Circuit. There was another case, California, Northern District, California against GM, against the auto companies, again seeking damages for harms as a result of global warming, also dismissed on political question uh, grounds as non-justiciable. Then there was Comer versus Murphy, uh, probably a case that followed the most tortured procedural path that I can think of. Uh, this was the case uh, in the Fifth Circuit uh, against oil companies, a variety of utilities, chemical companies, uh, energy companies, for damages for injuries as a result of Hurricane Katrina on the theory that the hurricane was intensified by warming seas as a result of climate change to which the defendants had contributed, initially dismissed by uh, the district court, but a three-judge panel uh, uh, reversed that dismissal. Then there was a rehearing on Bank that was vacated, and then ultimately the Fifth Circuit lost its quorum. Uh, it's hard to follow. We could talk about it if somebody's interested. And ultimately uh, dismissed the appeal, leaving the district court's dismissal of the suit in place. So there were many cases, along with the Second Circuit case, uh, in the field, so to speak, uh, and it helps to explain in part why the Supreme Court was so eager uh, to grant cert, not to mention that this was a very high profile uh, climate change uh, a, a case that raised important questions about uh, the future of litigation uh, for remedies for climate change. The SG's intervention, the Solicitor General intervening, raised a lot of eyebrows. There were some in the environmental community that were outraged that the Obama administration would intervene and support the, uh, and urge the court to grant cert in this case. Uh, thought maybe the SG would sit on the sidelines, but in fact, uh, one can understand why there might be a complicated mix of views uh, in the administration about uh, whether federal common law nuisance claims should proceed after the Supreme Court in Mass versus EPA had interpreted the Clean Air Act to give the EPA regulatory authority under the Clean Air Act uh, for addressing climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. So one can imagine um, that some in the administration, perhaps an EPA view, uh, would be different than the view of one of the defendants being sued in this case, the Tennessee Valley Authority, after all, an agency of the federal government that uh, the Solicitor General represents in the Supreme Court. And the views of the TVA might be still different from views of folks in the White House about the appropriate position to take on this case, and might be different still from the views of some uh, career staff and others in the Solicitor General's office. So, in order to manage and balance competing views, it's uh, quite understandable that the SG did ultimately intervene in support of petitioners. Uh, and what's key to understand about the intervention is the SG took a very moderate path. In writing, in, in the brief urging the court to grant cert, the Solicitor General, uh, acting Solicitor General Neil um, Katchal at the time, urged the court to grant, vacate, and remand the decision. Just send it back to the Second Circuit to reconsider uh, the intervening regulations that EPA had actually finalized between the time the Second Circuit originally decided the Clean Air Act did not displace these claims and now the, the point at which the court was considering cert. Uh, there had been a lot of activity and the Solicitor General said send it back to the Second Circuit trying to prevent the court from issuing an opinion and hearing the case. Uh, the court did not take uh, him up on that and instead uh, uh, heard the case. But you can see, even in the cert petition, this effort to narrow uh, the, the, uh, the ultimate potential impact of the decision. Uh, the merits brief also reveals a very moderate set of positions trying to walk a narrower path than uh, the petitioners were urging. For example, the Solicitor General recommended uh, it did not join the petitioners in arguing that the plaintiffs lacked Article III standing, uh, but instead argued prudential standing. There were prudential reasons for the court uh, not to hear the case, but they were not Article III uh, grounds for denying standing. The SG did not argue that the case uh, was not justiciable because it raised a political question, as the 
petitioners, uh, companies did. And the Solicitor General did not take the position that there was no federal common law in this area uh, for interstate pollution, and that there was no federal common law claim uh, uh, to remedy harms caused by greenhouse gas emissions. And the Solicitor General did not make a claim that there was, in fact, displacement of federal common law nuisance claims at the time the Second Circuit had heard the case. Uh, what the position was, uh, now that EPA has regulated, and there's a footprint in, uh, in uh, the regulatory path, now the Clean Air Act does displace. So it was a quite constrained uh, position. Uh, and the final thing the SG did not do was they did not endorse the view that the delegation of authority from Congress to the EPA, that delegation itself to regulate under the Clean Air Act, was in and of itself sufficient for displacement. Uh, so in fact, um, uh, the SG's role here, although it elicited quite a negative reaction from many on the side of the plaintiffs in the case, uh, was actually very likely uh, helped the court to find a, a middle path. There were 30 amicus briefs plus in this case, all the usual suspects, industry briefs on one side, environmentalist briefs on the other side, um, scholars briefs on both sides. Uh, interestingly, one brief filed on behalf of Fred Upton, the Republican member of the House, the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, currently trying to shut EPA's regulation of greenhouse gases down, and James Inhofe, the current uh, ranking member on the Senate uh, Committee of Environment and Public Works, uh, also uh, trying to shut EPA's uh, regulatory efforts down. The brief on their behalf argued that the case should be dismissed because it raised a political question and was not justiciable. Uh, so, oral argument. Um, oh, I forgot to mention Peter, Ke is it Keisler? Keisler, uh, who argued on behalf of the petitioners, uh, is an interesting, um, uh, well, there was a Hamdan reunion in the Supreme Court that we can talk about. Keisler and uh, the Solicitor General, Neil Kachal, were on either side of the famous Hamdan case in the George W. Bush administration, and they argued before then Judge Roberts, who was the uh, junior judge on the D.C. Circuit panel. Now they reunite in the Supreme Court for the AEP case. Uh, this time, Neil Kachal is the acting Solicitor General. Keisler's back in private practice arguing for the polluters, and uh, listen to me, the polluters, the companies. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Judge Roberts is the Chief Justice. Uh, at oral argument, I think the most telling uh, moment was when uh, Justice Ginsburg asked her first question right after uh, the Solicitor General for New York, Barbara Underwood, representing the respondents, stood up to argue. And if anybody had any hope at that moment, you know, cert was granted, and the minute cert was granted, everybody thought this case is a loss for the uh, plaintiffs, they're going down. The only question is how badly and how broadly will this decision be? And then clinging to the notion that perhaps Justice Ginsburg might provide a vote, a single vote for the uh, uh, plaintiffs, then comes Justice Ginsburg's question, which is quoted here, uh, basically to summarize, aren't you asking us to do what the EPA does, uh, signaling that she was not with the uh, plaintiffs on the argument. And Justice Kagan soon after uh, chimed in on the same in the same vein, suggesting that this is a paradigmatic uh, thing that administrative agencies do. You want us, the courts, uh, you're asking federal district court judges to set emission limits on uh, the greenhouse gases produced by major power companies and, and pr provide injunctive relief that requires us to do the very same thing that uh, regulatory agencies with much more expertise and resources uh, uh, normally do. Uh, Justice Breyer, in an interesting moment, asked the question um, of General Underwood, again representing the uh, plaintiff respondents, uh, do you think a court could set a tax as what, as in terms of providing the remedy here? And uh, there was a long set of exchanges in between the first posing of that question and the ultimate answer. He returned to it and said, well, let's just suppose, you know, you, a district court judge could set a carbon tax at, say, $20 a ton. Uh, and she said, well, you know, that probably wouldn't abate, the goal here is to abate the nuisance. And he said, that would abate the nuisance. Uh, you just bring in 15 economists and you get the tax right, which is a very Briarian uh, colloquy. And, and uh, ultimately, General Underwood demurred and said, I, I don't think so. And the point of the exchange was for Briar to make clear that if, if we can't, if courts can't establish a carbon tax, how is it they can set a cap on carbon and ratchet it down and determine the right level uh, over time. Uh, 
Justice Scalia spent a lot of time at oral argument making clear that he was nervous and upset about the possibility that denying standing, uh, Article III standing, if they did deny it, would ultimately just leave the plaintiffs to pursue these claims in state court, and he would prefer federal judges to deal with this uh, on the merits if it was going to be handled on the merits. Uh, he also, in numerous uh, uh, interventions, suggested that if the Supreme Court found the Clean Air Act displaced federal common law nuisance claims, surely the same reasoning supported the uh, conclusion that the Clean Air Act preempted state nuisance claims. So this should all be gone uh, with that finding. And uh, he got some support from Justice Kennedy, who piped up uh, on this issue by saying, it is, and he used the word odd, I would find it odd if uh, there were a finding of displacement and, it, and, and that uh, did not amount to preemption of state law. So there are some hints about uh, how these justices feel about the potential for these claims to go forward in state courts. Uh, uh, and finally, Justice Scalia uh, gave uh, the plaintiffs some trouble, gave General Underwood some trouble uh, trying to uh, expose the fact, and Justice Kagan was uh, making comments along the same lines, that this would be highly unmanageable. That there was, there's an endless number, uh, an indeterminate number of potential plaintiffs, and if you can sue these five power companies for their emissions and count them collectively as significant emissions, the most uh, significant share of emissions uh, in the electric sector, then uh, why can't you sue an aggregation of farms or cows and sort of making a number of funny interventions about suing individual farmers and individual uh, cows and potentially individual breeders for their uh, emission of carbon dioxide. Uh, suffice to say that it was not a great day uh, for under, uh, General Underwood, who was under assault from the moment she stood up. Uh, Peter Keisler, arguing for the petitioners, had a much nicer go of it. Uh, getting a number of fairly easy questions and allowing him to essentially make the argument uh, when Justice Kagan prodded him in this direction that uh, there really isn't any federal common law of interstate pollution left because the field has been so occupied by statute. Uh, so oral argument left folks with the impression, I think, this case was uh, going to be a big loss for, uh, for the plaintiffs, uh, but the question was ultimately uh, how narrow would it be? And as I said earlier, the court chose not to deny Article III standing, and even split on standing, not to find uh, that the case wasn't justiciable, question wasn't justiciable because it raised a political question, but rather simply that the Clean Air Act displaced federal common law claims. What's interesting about the test, if we can go back to the test for displacement earlier, um, Justice Ginsburg's opinion makes clear that to determine whether federal statute, whether a Congress has displaced federal common law claims, the question is whether Congress has addressed the precise question. It's a very Chevron-like sounding test. Uh, and it's not, the, the focus of the inquiry is not on what the EPA has done. Has the EPA exercised its authority in a way that the plaintiffs approve of? Is it a sufficient response to greenhouse gas emissions? Those are not the questions. The question is, did Congress address the question? In this case, answer is yes. Congress delegated authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions to the EPA under the Clean Air Act. And the court itself had provided that interpretation of the Clean Air Act. And that was sufficient uh, to show displacement. The implications of the case, just quickly, and then I think the panel discussion can bring much more nuance out. Uh, it, there is some uh, kind of sweet spot that I think industry and folks opposed to any kind of regulation for global warming uh, have landed in. Uh, who, who would have anticipated that the Supreme Court would have decided Mass versus EPA in 2007, giving EPA uh, authority to regulate, acknowledging that EPA had authority to regulate under the Clean Air Act, that a new administration would come in, an administration that had pledged to use executive power to regulate under the Clean Air Act, and that industry would find itself in a position where, having lost Mass versus EPA, that amounted to a situation in which Congress would be found to have displaced federal common law nuisance claims as an avenue of redress, and the EPA sitting with its regulatory authority would find itself completely hamstrung by the political situation at the time and finding itself in a very difficult position trying to move forward on 
uh, re with regulations. So in a way, industry is sitting in a terrific position where EPA is politically neutralized, uh, common law lawsuits seeking to use the federal courts as an avenue of redress, an alternative avenue, are neutralized. Uh, and the federal courts have really been eliminated as a lever for creating such uh, heterogeneity of approaches across the country out of federal district courts that the um, industry would be driven to Congress to ask them for a unifying scheme. That, I think, is one of the hopes, the strategies behind this litigation in the first place. Uh, so this was always a risk in a way, having one mass versus EPA. This is a casualty, you could say. AEP is a casualty of mass versus EPA. Uh, but there are still avenues open, said the court, and this is my final thought. Even though federal common law nuisance, public nuisance claims are displaced by the Clean Air Act, uh, there are things left, uh, there is redress left for the plaintiffs. They can sue EPA for failing to uh, uh, follow the Clean Air Act. If EPA fails to uh, promulgate rules, it's obligated to promulgate under the Clean Air Act. Uh, they can be petitioned uh, to promulgate those rules. Uh, this is, again, another irony. It's like being back to the future. It's like in the Bush administration, when environmentalist states and other parties ultimately petitioned the George W. Bush administration, arguing that the agency, EPA, had authority under the Clean Air Act that it was refusing uh, to use, and this led, of course, to Mass versus EPA. So it's uh, a bit of deja vu all over again, uh, but worse because we're back in a place politically where there's been some retrenchment and we're fighting again about the science, the validity of science. So we, we seem to have gone a little bit backwards, and maybe the panel could talk a bit about that. Finally, it's still potentially open uh, for plaintiffs to proceed uh, to, through state courts to bring state nuisance claims. I think some members of the court threw a lot of cold water on this prospect, suggesting that state claims would be preempted. Uh, but that finding has yet to be made. Uh, and finally, the court's uh, holding here that displacement depends on Congress delegating the power. The court's holding left open the possibility that if Congress now reverses itself and deprives EPA of authority under the Clean Air Act, uh, uh, amends the statute and takes away, that the federal common law claims can come rushing back in because there will no longer be displacement. So this raises an interesting question if that applies, if Congress simply puts an appropriations rider on a bill and uh, defunds EPA's efforts, uh, prohibits EPA from using funds to regulate greenhouse gases, does that amount to taking back uh, the delegation of authority? I think we probably have differing views on that, uh, but these are the avenues left open to the uh, plaintiffs. So again, the headline on the case, I think for most folks in the environmentalist community, the plaintiff side is, could have been much worse probably got away with the narrowest decision possible, no harm done on Article III standing, and we will wait to see whether EPA delivers on its promises of regulating GHGs. Well, um, I think that was an excellent presentation, and I, I'd just like to emphasize uh, Jody's point that we should look at this not just in terms of the, the case itself, uh, but as part of a dynamic in terms of the relationship to the other lawmaking institutions and how it really changes the uh, incentives. I have a little bit more favorable view of the case from the environmental side even than uh, Jody, perhaps because Barbara Underwood was my, was my evidence teacher in law school. <laughs> so, uh, But shortly after the case, I uh, said that if ever there was a a win in losing, the environmentalists won the AEP case. That's because not only the um, court decided it on the narrowest possible ground, as Jody explained, uh, but, but they left open the possibility of, of state common law nuisance cases. Uh, and in my view, that, that keeps the pressure on, on EPA to, to regulate. Um, I think one of the things that Jody and I have both written about, and John and I and know a lot from settlement, is that oftentimes it's very important to threaten people with an outcome that's even worse than compromise, uh, if you want to get people to compromise. And, and here, from an industry standpoint, the possibility of being faced with common law nuisance claims in a variety of states is, is even worse uh, from the industry standpoint than, than having federal regulation, particularly federal regulation that is concentrated primarily on the automobile and utility industries. 
I've written about this, Jody has written about it, but this is a, a familiar dynamic uh, in the past in terms of leading to uh, federal regulation, that is the, the threat and the possibility of, uh, of state level regulation. Um, and uh, Justice Kennedy may have uh, thought it would have been odd, uh, but uh, the, the issue had not really been briefed about state level regulation. And if and when it is, he's going to run into a very odd provision in Section 116 of the Clean Air Act, which says very clearly that states can continue to regulate provided they regulate more, more stringently than, than federal regulation. Uh, so it's going to be very hard, whatever the Supreme Court thinks is a policy matter, to avoid the possibility of state level regulation. And, and for this very reason, the Waxman-Markey climate bill, as it passed the House, as Jody well knows, uh, attempted to preempt state level use of trading systems for a, a, a three or four year period um, because it's, I think, clear as a bell uh, that under the Clean Air Act, um, states are permitted to regulate more stringently. And that's been interpreted by all of the lower courts to include nuisance and damage suits. Now, that's not as clear, uh, but that's, that's the existing law. So I think there's a real good possibility that if EPA doesn't regulate uh, in this area that we will see uh, action at the state level. So let's leave a case in which the Court of Appeals decision was decided by two judges and the Supreme Court decision was decided by eight judges, interesting by itself, and turn to another case out of last term, an original jurisdictional case. What, what is that? Original action is a case brought in the first instance in the U.S. Supreme Court uh, under the Constitution. It's a pretty rare case. This is the kind of case if you've you know, gone to law school, you've done extraordinarily well, uh, you're, you've made you know, all these great things, and you get the, the prize, right? The prize is the Supreme Court uh, clerkship, uh, and then you get the clerk of the Supreme Court, and then you find yourself doing uh, Montana uh, versus Wyoming. This is the kind of case which the clerks all think is a dog. Um, they don't want to uh, do it. Um, but those of us who teach and practice and write about this uh, find this utterly fascinating. Uh, these are great cases. And actually so too do the justices. Uh, the justices asked about 100 questions uh, during the oral argument uh, in this case. Uh, this case is absolutely rich in history, uh, of far-reaching uh, potential significance. Uh, and it's not often you get the U.S. Supreme Court to be talking about water law and basic water law. Uh, this is a case destined for the case books. I'm sure uh, John Leshy there and, and Joe Sachs and others will have this case in their case book uh, in the next edition. Now, to understand the issue and what was at stake in this case, you have to understand something about water and about water law. Water is this unbelievable resource. It's this amazing uh, resource. It's important for everything, uh, for agriculture, transportation, energy, manufacturing, and it's renewable uh, to boot. Uh, the problem is it won't sit still. Uh, it keeps moving everywhere, uh, and it won't even stay in the same physical state. Uh, it switches uh, from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Uh, as a result, sharing water, not in the Robert Heinlein sense, but sharing water uh, becomes both very essential and very challenging. And that's the role of water law, uh, to figure out how to share water effectively and efficiently. Now, in the United States, water is traditionally uh, the subject of state law. This case is unusual because it provides an instance when federal law is governing and the Supreme Court needs to step in and answer a question of federal law uh, for state law. The reason it's federal law is in this instance, the controlling law is an interstate compact uh, entered into by three states who share uh, the Yellowstone River, uh, Wyoming, uh, Montana, and North Dakota. Interstate compact authorized, consented to by Congress, allowed them to agree on an allocation scheme <laughs> for the three, but the terms of the compact then become a matter of federal law uh, entered into by all the states. Uh, in this instance, Montana has filed the original action in the Supreme Court complaining uh, that Wyoming is violating the compact, uh, that Wyoming is using too much water. Um, and Montana has raised a whole series of, of allegations to that effect. Uh, this case actually only concerns one of them, one decided by the special master who happens to be a very distinguished water law scholar and professor at Stanford law school. One issue, and that's the issue before uh, the Supreme uh, Court uh, in the case. Uh, so Montana files this case, and the legal dispute is whether Wyoming's shift uh, in uh, the way it's using the water in some sense violates the interstate compact. And what Wyoming did was they shift to a more efficient 
system of irrigation. Uh, now, why would that be a problem? Uh, an upstream state is using a more efficient system uh, than downstream. Uh, that should be a good thing. Everyone should like that, more efficiency. Water law is not so simple uh, as to say that's necessarily a good thing. The problem is uh, that it's more efficient for Wyoming, uh, but the more efficient use by Wyoming means less water is going back into the river uh, and less water is going downstream to Montana. So Montana's complaint is that Wyoming is violating the compact by using water more efficiently, by using these more efficient uh, systems than it did uh, before. And the question is whether that's a violation of interstate compact or not. Um, the court, in opinion by Justice Thomas, uh, Justice uh, Kagan is out of the case because the issue was before the Solicitor General's office when she was there. They agree with Wyoming and the special master this is no violation. The efficient use was not a violation. Uh, the court concludes first that Wyoming's action is consistent with traditional prior appropriation doctrine in both Wyoming uh, and Montana. Now the reason why the court looked to a prior appropriation doctrine to determine the meaning of the interstate compact was that the compact itself says that the rights of the parties will be governed by, quote, the doctrine of appropriation. And then the court, in deciding what the doctrine of appropriation meant, look to the laws of prior appropriation doctrine, that's a first in time, first in right doctrine, look to the laws of Wyoming and Montana <coughs> to try to decide what the federal compact meant. So look to state law to try to decide the meaning of the federal compact. The reason why the court looked to Wyoming and Montana's laws in answering the question, they said, well, Wyoming and Montana entered into this. This is like a contract. So we need to look to the intent of the parties. And Wyoming would have been thinking about appropriation doctrine like Montana, like Wyoming law. Montana would have thought about it like from Montana law. So let's look to those areas. So the court looks to prior appropriation doctrine in Wyoming and Montana law to answer the federal question and says, well, actually, in some respects, it's not clear. Prior appropriation doctrine about what to do when you use a more efficient use this way, it's not completely clear what the answer is. Uh, what you can't do as a prior appropriator, what you can't do is cause injury to a downstream appropriator. You can't do it by changing the use, the location, or the purpose of your upstream diversion. So the question is, by using a more efficient irrigation system, by more efficient sprinklers, are, have they changed the use, purpose, or location? If they have, then that's a violation. And the court says, it's close, but we look at it, we actually think they haven't. We think they haven't. Um, the law in the area is not settled, but we think the better answer is, it's not a violation because we look to prior appropriation doctrine, an upstream person can, they can change crops, and crops can cause uh, more consumption. They can change pumps and use a more efficient pump. That doesn't change it. Uh, we think this is on that side of the line rather than the other side of the line, uh, going that way. Um, that's the better uh, answer. Uh, then the court rejects the alternative argument that the compact itself somehow overrides traditional prior appropriation doctrine, and the, contract, the compact itself restricts Wyoming to the amount of water that it used when they entered into this compact in 1950. What's the significance of the court's ruling? Uh, the first is interpretation promotes rather than discourages sufficient use of water. If the court had ruled the other way, then people upstream would be discouraged from greater efficiency. So the court's decision this way has a positive effect on efficient use of water. Um, the second reason why the case is significant uh, is although water law is the province of states, and this is the U.S. Supreme Court talking about something, a matter of federal law, everyone's going to listen to this. The, the state courts in interpreting state law will be influenced by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and that's why in this, in this opinion, the court takes sort of uh, extra caution to say, look, we know we're talking about this. Uh, we know this is normally what you do. Uh, you can do whatever you want to do. Wyoming, you can decide what it means for Wyoming. Montana, you can decide what it means for Montana. You don't have to follow us. But they're probably going to be pretty tempted to do so. Uh, so the court in drops footnotes, whenever the Supreme Court drops the footnotes, it means it's important. They drop footnotes to say, look, there's some things we're not answering about whether law is frozen or not. There's some things we're not answering in terms of state law. Uh, but still, this is our ruling. This will have influence. The Supreme Court has weight. It's not precedential, but has weight in the courts, especially state courts on these kinds of issues. The other thing interesting about this case has got to be the dissent. Uh, the dissent, oh, actually one more thing just for fun. In the opinion, uh, for those of you 
I, I love the fact that Justice Thomas' opinion inside the nutshell. Uh, for those of you who <laughs> worry that you shouldn't show that you look at the nutshell, uh, the Supreme Court relies on the nutshell. Uh, you can be proud to have your nutshell. All right, uh, the dissent in the case, just to leave, forget what he writes on the merits, uh, who cares about that in this case? Uh, it's the dissent is just entertaining. We have to spend a moment on it. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is his use of the word Wyomans uh, to refer to people from uh, Wyoming. Uh, he drops a footnote and says, look, the dictionary term is Wyomingite. Uh, that actually also means the kind of lava. Uh, I don't like that one. I think the people of Wyoming deserve better. <laughs> so he creates his own uh, his term of art. Uh, th the second thing he does in his dissent um, is he talks about how the majority is just going on and on and they're spending pages and pages to work all this stuff out. Uh, he says, you know, how many cases they had to read uh, to, to do this. Uh, and then he has this line which just boggled me when I read it. He said, a question that would cross a rabbi's eyes. And, and I read that and I said, a question that would cross a rabbi's eyes. What does that mean? Uh, why does he have that in this original action case between Wyoming and Montana? Uh, it's probably the reason why he wrote the dissent, was just to put this line uh, in there. Um, and anyone know what that's from? Here's a hint. <laughs> Fiddle on the Roof. Zero Mostel and Fiddle on the Roof. Uh, the song, very famous song of Wyo Richman. Uh, I could sing it for you, but I won't. Uh, but if you go through it, uh, pardon me, posing problems that would cross a rabbi's eyes. Uh, that's the source uh, of Justice Scalia's <laughs> thing. Uh, and if you watch the tape on YouTube, you'll see Zero Mostel does this wonderful crossing of his eyes uh, when he says it. Um, last thing I want to talk about before we move on. Uh, one significant cert denial uh, last term. Uh, and that is the Guggenheim v. City of Galetta uh, case. Uh, this is a regulatory takings case. Uh, the reason I just want to point it out uh, is under the Rehnquist Court, uh, the Supreme Court heard regulatory casing case after regulatory takings case, one after another for about 30, uh, 30 years. Uh, a lot of cases. This is a really important issue of environmental law. To what extent environmental restrictions uh, impinge so much on private property rights uh, so as to amount to unconstitutional taking. It's been an open question to what extent the Roberts Court would take on and keep taking uh, these cases. Uh, a major effort was made in this case to get the court to take it. Uh, they hired Ted Olson, who is a terrific lawyer, very highly respected uh, by the justices. Uh, he got a whole series of amicus briefs filed on his behalf, uh, and the court denied cert. Uh, that's at least a sign. Uh, we'll see, it's a sign, probably a good sign for environmentalists, the court might not be so interested uh, in these cases, because there's still five justices up there who are ready to say something about private property rights, but they've not yet found a case they want. Thank you. All right, panel, let's move. Let's move from last term to this term. Last year, the Supreme Court, they decided 82 merit decisions. Uh, right now, they have granted cert in 48 cases. They're a little light uh, uh, right now, but there may be more. But what we're, we're going to talk about right now are the cases that have been uh, uh, granted, and then some of them that have not are still in the on deck circle, if you will, uh, where cert is pending. Clearly, the most important environmental case right now is a wetland case. Don, I'd like you to do it, but it seems to me that the Supreme Court has not done well lately on wetland cases. Now, having mucked up Rapanos, what's What's going to happen in this case? And then if you would, there was, Richie mentioned one cert denial, but there's another cert denial involving General Electric. And would you please comment and see whether or not that's relevant? Thank you very much, John. Uh, appreciate uh, Jody and, and Richard, uh, including me and Martha. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, very, very kind introduction, John. My, my father would have been proud and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, this, uh, this case is uh, a, uh, a nightmare scenario uh, for, uh, for EPA. Um, it was something that uh, I, I worried about uh, back when I was general counsel of EPA 20, 20 years ago and uh, threatened to write a, a legal opinion about it and uh, the regional administrators headed me off by getting together 
and uh, deciding that they would uh, they would never create this this set of facts, uh, which potentially is explosive if it ever got to the uh, got to the Supreme Court for the reasons that I'll explain. Uh, this is a case brought nominally in the name of a nice young couple named Michael and Chantel Sackett, who live in a rental apartment and finally got together enough money to spend $22,000 to buy a, uh, a lot in a subdivision 500 feet away from uh, a lake. And those of you who look closely at the, the picture of their property will notice down here that it's, uh, it's dirt and stone. It's not, it's not wet. There's no, lo there's no water on the property. But nonetheless, um, shortly after they started site work on the property, the local EPA region gave them what's called a unilateral administrative order uh, to stop construction uh, and actually to restore the property uh, and to keep it in its pristine state for three years on the grounds that it was a, uh, uh, it was a wetland. Um, this unilateral administrative order device is uh, a device that exists under essentially all of the environmental statutes, the Clean Air Act, the CERCLA, RCRA, and it was intended in the legislative history for very, very clear violations. Situation where somebody has a, uh, a specific numerical pollution standard or pollution emission limit uh, and they uh, violate it, you basically give them an order to get back in compliance with the, uh, with, with the law. So it's a very cut and dry matter. The difficulty with it is that there are substantial penalties for, um, for violation uh, and as a result, uh, the Sackett case has become uh, a conservative cause celeb. You can see what uh, Rand Paul says about it in the Washington Times. So this one is a, uh, is, is a, a, a little bit like um, some of the cases in the, uh, in the 1930s, like the Schechter case, where a um, poor little chicken farmer on uh, Long Island is out uh, uh, is out in the Supreme Court challenging some of the regulations, and in fact, a great deal of American industry is uh, is behind him. And we'll we'll talk in a minute about the uh, the GE versus Jackson case. But um, the the practice of EPA issuing unilateral enforcement orders has been one of the top targets of industry and the uh, and the Chamber of Commerce, and they've hired some very high-powered guns uh, to challenge that. Um, the Supreme Court denied cert in a, in a case called GE versus Jackson that was brought by uh, GE and ha had uh, been going for several years as a due process challenge to unilateral orders under the Superfund law, but it granted instead uh, this case, which appears to have much more uh, appealing facts. So the, the key question presented in the case is, does an administrative order violate constitutional due process? And uh, the Ninth Circuit, and I think essentially pretty much all the other circuits, said no, it doesn't violate due process because while EPA can give you an order uh, and there is nominally a $37,500 a day penalty for violating the order, EPA can't assess the penalty. It has to go to court and sue you. And the Ninth Circuit said when EPA sues in court, the court can determine whether or not there was actually a violation because it can take into account if there was a good faith uh, uh, violation and, and award nominal penalties, uh, or it can determine, as was the issue in this case, that EPA had no jurisdiction because there was no wetland, and in that case, there wouldn't be any penalties for violating the order. So this is very similar to the historical practice of violating, a con of violating an order from a court being held in contempt and then being able to challenge it uh, on, on appeal. But nonetheless, the Pacific Legal Foundation um, brought a cert petition, which was very, I think, very well drafted. Um, and they relied primarily on a 1994 case called the Thunder Basin Coal case. Uh, that's a case in which um, a union was certified. There was a, a, a requirement to post the names of the, post the certification of the union representative. Uh, somebody sued claiming that that was uh, unconstitutional uh, because they couldn't go to court to challenge it. They just had to go ahead and post it. And most of the Supreme Court uh, avoided the issue by saying, oh, it's just de minimis to have to post this information and you can go to court uh, afterwards. 
But there is language in the opinion uh, that it would be constitutionally intolerable if somebody were put to a choice between complying with an administrative order and coercive penalties. So that, that is essentially uh, the issue that's, uh, that's raised in the, in the Sackett case. It's interesting, the Solicitor General filed, uh, I thought, a, just a terrific opposition to cert. John probably worked on it. Um, and it pointed out there was really no conflict in, in, uh, in circuits uh, and that it was pretty easy to get a judicial, um, a judicial uh, ruling. Uh, they said you could apply for a, a permit, for a wetlands permit, and then EPA would deny it, and then you could, then you could uh, appeal from the uh, denial. So there was a pretty clear route to uh, a court. And also, Pacific Legal Foundation um, relied on this prior case called TVA versus Whitman, uh, but there is language in the Clean Water Act that is significantly different than the language in the Clean Air Act under TVA versus Whitman. Um, not, and I've quoted it here, but it seems to say pretty clearly that you can only sue for penalties for any violation for which EPA is authorized to issue a compliance order. So um, pretty clear statutory basis for saying you can raise all of the issues uh, in the suit to, uh, uh, to enforce the uh, uh, compliance order. But nonetheless, the uh, Supreme Court uh, granted cert. Part of the difficulty, I think, is, and the reason I call it a self-inflicted wound, is we've struggled for about 30 years uh, to define uh, a wetland. And uh, Dan Quayle, years ago, people made fun of him for saying, if it isn't wet, um, well, maybe we shouldn't call it a wetland. But at least that was a pretty clear administrable test. You, know, you, could, you could actually tell. The difficulty that we've gotten into under Justice Kennedy's much more sophisticated test which you can read. And by the way, there's a big fight in the circuits about whether or not Kennedy's test is really the governing law because all eight other justices disagreed with him, but he was the decisive vote. So we have a conflict in circuits as to whether or not Kennedy's view is actually the governing view. But under Kennedy's view, the Pacific Legal Foundation recites statistics in their, uh, in their cert petition claiming that it costs over $270,000 to apply for a wetlands permit, because you have to do all these studies about whether or not there's an effect on the water and so on. So they argue that that means that the, uh, the option of applying for a permit uh, isn't really uh, available because you'd have, to, you'd have to spend money that's far in excess of the uh, value of the property. The other thing that from their petition, which I think is really uh, quite significant, is they argue that EPA on an annual basis is issuing roughly 3,000 administrative orders and only 400 court referrals. So the, the process of issuing these unilateral orders <coughs> and threatening people with very heavy penalties if they don't uh, comply with them has become the mainstay of EPA uh, enforcement. And the Pacific Legal Foundation does, I think, a very good job in their, in their brief of contrasting the rights that EPA gives you in an administrative order context with the rights that you would, uh, that you would have in court. So I think it's a very, very dangerous case. Uh, I'm surprised the court took it. Um, they probably shouldn't have, but what should the Supreme Court do now? Well, ideally, um, I'd like to see them dismiss cert as improvidently granted. Uh, but I don't think that's likely to happen. The governing test for due process challenges comes out of a case called Matthews versus Eldridge, and you're supposed to look at the risk of error and the, the costs and the benefits of additional process. There really is no record at all about that in Sackett versus EPA. On the other hand, in the uh, case in which CERT was denied, the GE versus Jackson case, there were several years of discovery, a very long trial in the district court, and the district court found that out of 3,000 administrative orders, there were only three of them where EPA had made a mistake. So very, very low risk of error from a due process standpoint. That's the case which is not in the Supreme Court in which the Supreme Court denied cert. Um, one possibility, another possibility, is to affirm the Ninth Circuit's statutory construction. Um, I think that's not too likely. The Supreme Court doesn't take Ninth Circuit cases real often in order to uh, uh, affirm them. Um, I think the best that we can hope for on this is that the court will reverse the Ninth Circuit on no pre-enforcement uh, APA judicial review 
Um, in other words, right now when you get an administrative order, you don't get to go to court to challenge the administrative order because it's not deemed uh, final agency action. Um, rather, you only get judicial review when they, when they go to court to seek penalties against you. One possibility is to construe the statute to permit uh, a court action to challenge the EPA order immediately. That's what we call pre-enforcement review. Um, and that would be a way out. Um, uh, and in fact, the Ninth Circuit decision handles very, in a very odd way the key administrative law case on this point, which is Abbott versus Gardner, which is supposed to be uh, uh, the case governing whether or not you get pre-enforcement review, and it's supposed to be based on a balance of substantial hardship, and the more the Pacific Legal Foundation argues that there is substantial hardship to poor Michael and Chantel, uh, the more they're really developing a case that there should be pre-enforcement review under Abbott versus Gardner. The, uh, the Supreme Court, um, uh, I think, um, ought to reverse on Abbott versus Gardner. The Ninth Circuit suggests a very, very odd citation that somehow Abbott versus Gardner has been, uh, has been overruled. I think we have two administrative law professors on the Supreme Court in Scalia and Breyer. Kagan, um, Kagan. And Kagan <laughs> as well, um, who uh, all know that, uh, th that that's not the case. Uh, in addition, although Justice Kennedy is key, um, both Scalia and Thomas reached the constitutional <laughs> issue in Thunder Hill and said that in their view, there was no due process violation <laughs> if judicial review is provided before a penalty for noncompliance can, uh, can be imposed. So it seems to me to be a very, very uh, strange case, but a very dangerous one. And with that, I'll stop and turn over my colleagues to uh, add anything. I know we're short on time, but I, I'll also just say one thing about Don's excellent presentation. When he said it was a nightmare case, I, I, I think it is, uh, even though these facts are quite rare and quite uh, terrible, uh, the, the potential reach of a broad decision here would really uh, remove the flexibility that EPA has to use compliance orders as a major instrument of enforcement across a variety of statutes. I think that's the potential we're worried about. Think about the concrete implication of essentially having to provide an opportunity for pre-enforcement review of every administrative order to stop doing something that's environmentally harmful, to stop emitting, to cease and desist. Uh, think of how that tool then is lost to the agency as a cheap, effective way to basically kick off what, as Wendy Jacobs described to me yesterday in a great conversation about this, what is essentially is a negotiation with the party about then what to do to remediate the problem. If, if they have to offer pre-enforcement review, uh, folks just won't come to the table. They just won't negotiate. They won't be able to come to some uh, settlement. And so it just makes it harder and harder for the agency across the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, CERCLA, uh, which maybe Richard can speak to a bit, it's potentially really devastating for CERCLA cleanup orders uh, if, if the language of the, de if the decision is, is so broad. So I think this could really be uh, a terrible loss of an enforcement tool for the agency in practice and remove some important leverage the agencies have to enforce. And that's really disastrous at a time when enforcement resources are ever more scarce. Uh, they're having to do so much more with less and now you take away right. uh, their tools. Let me just put, add a footnote to that. I agree with that entirely. but. Um, I've actually had some of these cases uh, where we, where I actually was doing one pro bono for a little private school in Connecticut, where we got one of these uh, nasty letter slash orders from EPA, and we immediately uh, sat down with them, went into an informal process of negotiation, told them that they didn't have jurisdiction, and eventually worked it out with them. So, the notion that there is no hearing here is actually a legal fiction. It's an informal, negotiated kind of hearing, and in fact, that took place with the Sacketts. Um, um, what happened is that they entered into a process of negotiation with EPA, and there were three modifications to the, uh, uh, to the, to the, to the order as a result of this back and forth. But they got in the, they got in the hands of uh, the, the, the lawyers from a, a think tank that basically wanted to raise the constitutional issue of is there, an, is there a formal judicial style hearing uh, and does, um, uh, does uh, the constitutional due process require that? So as often happens when cases go up on a, uh, appeal, particularly the Supreme Court, the issue becomes reified in one in terms of a, a, a false issue, an issue that isn't really there. But as far as the record shows, there was no hearing. But in fact, I believe there was. 
All right, so since I was at the Department of Justice when both of these cases came up and I led the effort on GE versus EPA, I will only say that after the cert was denied at GE, I pretty much closed my books on Sackett, thinking, why in the world would they take that case after having denir denied cert on uh, GE? I was obviously wrong. Uh, I want to pass it to uh, uh, Richard for two things. First of all, your comments on this case, and then if you would, since you're doing so well on state of Montana and water cases, would you actually turn to the, probably the next biggest case uh, on this term, also involving those issues? Right. I'd like to do so. Let me quick comment on, on the Sackett case. I think Don has it exactly right. This case is going to do a major turnaround in, in the Supreme Court, uh, and the court has already given us a, a, an express hint that that's what they're doing. Uh, this petition raised exclusively the question of wh whether, in the absence of pre-enforcement judicial review, whether there was a violation of due process. That was the only issue raised in the petition. Uh, they did not raise the petition whether, in fact, uh, they should be entitled to pre-enforcement review as a matter of statute. They didn't because all five circuits who have addressed the issue have said there's no pre-enforcement review. They did not raise the statutory issue, They're just the constitutional issue. When the Supreme Court granted cert, they first scheduled the case for a conference in June, on June 23rd, and they didn't decide what to do. They then rescheduled it for conference on June 27th. Uh, so they heard it twice at conference. Then they issued the order on June 28, granting cert. And when they granted cert, they added a question. They rewrote the questions presented. Uh, they added the statutory question. Uh, the question wasn't there in the petition. They added it. Uh, they added the question whether may petitioners seek pre enforcement judicial review of the administrative compliance order pursuant to the Administrative Procedure Act, 5 U.S.C. 704. There was no reference to Administrative Procedure Act anywhere in the petition. The court added a question. Uh, that tells you what the court plans to do. They were outraged by the facts. The court, I don't think, is going to say this violation of due process. This is a conservative court does not like the idea of saying there's a liberty or property interest here that supports due process. They're not going to like it. They denied cert in GE because in the GE CERCLA case, CERCLA expressly says there's no pre enforcement judicial review. It's written in the statute. Uh, so I think we know what they're going to do. Uh, and that will still be the problem that, that Jody said. Right. The government's very dependent upon no pre-enforcement judicial review. The court's going to now, I think, going to say, if, if Congress doesn't say it expressly, they've got it. Right. So circular safe. And circular safe. Except for the separate concurring opinion written by some of the other justices. <laughs> but there won't be five. All right, the next case I'm going to talk about, the other case granted uh, for the upcoming term is PPL Montana v. State of Montana. As John said, I'm in charge of Montana today <laughs> and water cases. Uh, this case involves state ownership of the beds of Navigal waters. Now, that may sound pretty rarefied and incidental uh, to some of you, but it's anything but. The ownership of the beds of Navigal waters is a fundamental uh, asset, an incident of state sovereignty. The original 13 colonies, when they became uh, states, they received ownership of the beds of navigable waters. And it's so important that under the Equal Footing Doctrine, the Supreme Court has made clear, every subsequently admitted state gets, as part of an essential attribute of sovereignty, ownership of the beds of navigable waters. Uh, they're incredibly important in the nation's history, navigable waters and the beds. They were literally the highways of commerce uh, in the 19th century. Uh, today, they're no longer the exclusive highways of commerce, but navigable waters still play a huge role in commerce. Uh, and they also play a huge role in lots of commercial activities, uh, recreation, environmental values as well. Uh, the stakes in this case are so high that that's why you see two unbelievably heavyweight Supreme Court lawyers going at it uh, in this case. Uh, former Solicitor General Paul Clement and former Solicitor General Greg Garr on either side. Both these folks have brought in major lawyers. And in this case, uh, what is happening, uh, I'm going to skip ahead, um, is Montana uh, is claiming ownership of the bed of the upper Missouri River in Montana, uh, including portions of the river uh, where there's a major hydroelectric facility are located, the Great Falls Reach. It's about 17 mile reach uh, right up there at the, at, the, at the start up there. They say they own the bed. Uh, the utility companies which have these hydroelectric facilities say you don't own the bed of it. Uh, you never claimed you owned the bed for the last 100 years. Uh, we've had these licenses forever. Now you say you own the bed. And you say you own the bed, and because you own the bed, you, we owe you tens of millions of dollars in retroactive payments for rent uh, for use of this property, and probably hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, the, in the future uh, in this case. 
Um, the Montana state courts, as tends to happen, not surprisingly, ruled in favor of Montana. Uh, that almost always happens. Um, uh, and they basically ruled in favor of Montana, and this was on a motion for summary judgment on whether Montana owned the beds uh, of this area uh, or not, the Navajo water. Uh, now, there are two issues in the case. Uh, the first issue is what's the test? Uh, what's the test of navigability for the purposes of state title? Is it navigable at the time of statehood? Is it navigable now? How much evidence does there have to be of navigability? Uh, what's the burden of proof? Uh, the other question is, how much of the river has to be navigable before the river is navigable? Um, if parts of the river are navigable, but parts of it are not navigable, is the whole thing navigable, or just the parts which are navigable in fact? Uh, in this case, what the Montana Supreme Court said is this part's navigable, this part's navigable, this part in the area is a little tough. It's a little tough. <laughs> Uh, to navigate. Uh, but on either side it was, and people often could pick up their boats, go on shore and walk them through portage and get to the other and drop it down, so that makes the whole thing navigable. Uh, those are the two issues in front of the court. What's the test and how much of the river? Uh, I will tell you now the likely result in the case. Uh, the court's going to reverse. Uh, they're going to say the motion for summary judgment uh, was inappropriate. And they're going to say that you have to have a segment by segment approach. Uh, you can't treat the whole river as one river for the purposes uh, of state title. And you have to do it based on evidence of navigation at statehood. Not now, but at statehood. Uh, not whether it was in fact navigable at the time of statehood, but whether it either was in fact navigable or susceptible to improvements which would lead to navigation. So the fact that it is currently navigable would be evidence that it might have been in the past. But the test is still in the past, not uh, in the present. Uh, the court's going to say we do this segment by segment. Um, and the fact that this is navigable and this is navigable doesn't make a segment in between navigable. It doesn't do it. Uh, that isn't, and the fact that there's a segment in between which isn't navigable doesn't make these non-navigable either. They can still be navigable because of the portage in between. But the portage in between doesn't make the segment in the middle navigable. It makes the other parts uh, navigable. Um, so to look for in the case when it comes down is a couple things. What the court says about how short the segment has to be. How short is it before it becomes a distinct segment? A line drawing question. One mile, two miles. This is 17 miles. It ain't short. So this is easy. But what the court says about how short it has to be for inquiry uh, is important. The other thing is what the court says about the definition of navigability. And this is where there's real potential here for confusion. Uh, the term navigable waters is a term of art in natural resources law. And the same term is used for all these different kinds of tests. There's a test of navigable waters for title. There's a test of navigable waters for admiralty jurisdiction. There's a test of navigable waters for navigation servitude. And there's a test of navigable waters for the Commerce Clause Authority in the Clean Water Act. Every one of these use the same term, navigable waters but it means something different in those. Title, very narrow. Commerce Clause, Clean Water Act, very broad. What people are worried about is a sloppily written opinion or misinterpretation by lower courts, it happens all the time, will cause courts to misunderstand or cause the justices to misunderstand what they're writing about. They write something sloppy and here they say a very narrow definition for title purposes, but they use it in a way using the wrong precedent, the wrong cases, the wrong citations, it could be overread uh, by the lower courts. The national environmental groups have sort of kept out of the case, as far as I can tell. Uh, they decide they're not going to play. Maybe they don't want to play because they don't want the justice to be thinking about all those other issues, but just to do uh, the title question. That's it. Those are the two major cases. But remember, I told you there were some yet that are undecided, what I call the on deck circle. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask each of our uh, 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 speakers to just pick out their favorite one, if they would, on the on-deck circle, and then we're going to hold the Delta smelt into a separate category. Joy? I will be super fast on mine. It's an interesting case uh, from the Ninth Circuit. Um, uh, a cert has not yet been granted. It's pending, uh, nor has it been denied. Um, it's uh, uh, Pacific Merchant Shipping Association versus Goldstein. Basically, what this case is about is California's effort, California Air Resources Board, an air pollution uh, uh, agency within California, has required all ships 
off the coast of California out to 24 miles, which is 21 miles beyond their state territorial waters, to uh, comply with fuel regulation that requires them to use low polluting fuels, low sulfur fuels, if those ships, which are operating in international commerce and interstate commerce, if those ships dock at a port in California. So think of all the traffic that comes through Long Beach, South Cal uh, so Southern California. Uh, they are producing enormous amounts of uh, pollution with localized health effects that are very serious. And this is California's ex effort to regulate uh, the fuels used by those ships. It, it, the, the reason there's a cert petition is the Ninth Circuit uh, um, did not invalidate, as they were asked to do by the Pacific Merchant um, uh, Shipping Association, did not invalidate the regulations as a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, and did not rule that the Submerged Lands Act preempted this extraterritorial application uh, of California's regulatory authority. Uh, they, I, won't, I don't have time for the analysis, but they held that uh, although this pressed the outer edges of the state's police powers, there was a strong local interest in uh, reducing this pollution, and it did not run afoul of uh, the constitutional prohibition or uh, the Submerged Lands Act. So, uh, you know, uh, we will see if they grant cert. I think it seems less likely. Richard commented yesterday that it was in conference, discussing conference on Monday, and there was no order on Tuesday, so chances get lower and lower. The final interesting feature of this is there's a very, very bad case for California, if it does get granted, called U.S. versus Locke, uh, a case from 2000 in which Kennedy wrote the opinion for a unanimous court invalidating Washington State's uh, regulation of vessels off its coast, and Kennedy wrote some really broad language about the federal presence, the need for uniformity, and uh, one gets the feeling that California will have an uphill battle uh, trying to defend extraterritoriality in this context. John? Uh, well, the case I'd like to mention is National Association of Home Builders versus San Joaquin Valley Unified Air Pollution Control District. Um, this is another uh, federal, potentially federal preemption case, and it involves the complicated provisions of the Clean Air Act defining state and federal relationships. We mentioned that the general uh, rule under the Clean Air Act under Section 116 is that states can continue to regulate provided they do so more stringently rather than less stringently. There's an exception to that general rule for motor vehicle engines, uh, where federal rules are preemptive unless uh, EPA gives a waiver, and Jody mentioned the climate change waiver and, and uh, how that was worked out. Um, this is a case, and, and then there's yet another provision relating to what are called indirect sources. Those are things like parking lots or other things that uh, EPA started regulating in the in the 70s, and then Congress amended the law in 1977 in Section 115 to say that EPA couldn't regulate them, but the states could. This case poses a, a challenge as to whether or not the regulation of construction sites in the San Joaquin Valley that requires them to make a certain percentage reduction is tantamount to a regulation of the construction equipment engines. Uh, and so it, uh, it's, a, it's a quite complicated case. I think the chances that the court would grant cert are very low. Uh, it's another Ninth Circuit opinion, and there was a dissent by Judge Smith who basically said this is a question for EPA. Uh, and after the case was decided, EPA approved the action by uh, San Joaquin. So I, <laughs> I think it's going to be a little difficult to get cert in that one. My Ninth Circuit case, by the way, is not really a Ninth Circuit case because the judge who wrote the opinion is a Third Circuit judge sitting by designation. So I think it might not. If, <laughs> that's a plus for it. <laughs> Richard. Uh, two very, just a couple seconds on two cases because I think it's more important to get back to Don with Stuart and Jasper and, and the Q&A. Uh, this is a pending cert petition called Farina v. Nokia. It's a question whether state tort law is preempted by the Federal Communication uh, Commission Authority over cell phone. Uh, use, uh, state tort law claiming uh, that the cell phone radiation uh, causes damage and bring an action against Nokia, a, a state class action on that basis. Um, the the uh, court asked the views of the Solicitor General whether to take the case, uh, which is a point, but the SG recently said don't take the case, and I think the court won't uh, take the case. Uh, Morrison Enterprises v. Dravo, uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, circular super fund case involving the ability of a party who spent some money to recover uh, costs back.
from other parties who are liable uh, for the hazardous waste site. Uh, there are two provisions of the statute, 113 and 107. Both allow you different pathways. The court has been involved in this issue now for a couple of cases recently, but when you use 113, when you use 107, um, th these parties are basically saying there's an open issue out here which, it, which uh, about whether we should go 113 or whether we can go 107. I'm not going to give you more details than that. The court's going to then assert. Uh, the case is really pretty boring. Thank God. <laughs> All right. Now I want it done. I wanted to save one. Are you, are you, are you done, with? Richard, I, want to say, I wanted to save what, a case that we called always at justice, the Delta Smelt case. I think we had attorneys permanently assigned to the Central Valley Project uh, ever since John Leshy was Solicitor of Interior. Uh, but this is fascinating. I would like you to handle it, please. Well, I will. And just before I turn to it, let me just make one sort of meta observation, uh, and that is that in all of these cases we've been talking about, we've been talking about using the Supreme Court in one way or another to preempt state activities. And I think that's an important theme, that as we've had a kind of uh, stasis develop in many areas of policymaking in Washington, a lot of the action has moved to the states, and a lot of the action in the Supreme Court is using various doctrines to try to uh, retard the states. And every one of the major cases we've talked about has that same, uh, that same dynamic. It's not so much that I think this Stewart and, and Jasper case is an important case so that the Supreme Court is likely to grant cert, but what it does do is it reflects a very important issue that's lurking out there, and that is the relationship between the Commerce Clause and environmental statutes. It's, a, it's an issue that came to the fore when, when Richard's old roommate, uh, John, John Roberts, in 2003, in his first case in the D.C. Circuit, dissented from denial of rehearing and bonk, uh, referring to a hapless toad, which for reasons best known to itself only lives in California. Uh, and uh, this has raised the issue of whether or not uh, the um, Congress can, can regulate in-state activities. Um, I think that now that Justice Kagan is on the Supreme Court, it might very well be that the court might take that issue just to lay this issue to rest. There is no conflict at all in the lower courts. The lower courts have all essentially accepted the notion that there's this web of commerce uh, that often goes back to uh, Wickard versus Filburn. Poor old Roscoe uh, Filburn gets prosecuted for, uh, for raising wheat on his, own, uh, on his own farm and feeding it to his family. I know my law school classmate Clarence Thomas was always very upset about that. It actually goes back a generation, couple generations prior to that to something called the Shreveport Rail Cases in 1866. So I think it's very unlikely that the Supreme Court will, will really follow the Roberts lead uh, and hold that all of the environmental statutes are unconstitutional to the extent that they regulate in-state activities. Um, but what I do think is that with the uh, Obama health care case coming, uh, they might very well want to take an interstate commerce clause case and write some good language on both sides that could be, could be used to uh, talk about these interlocking web, webs of relationships uh, and an effect on commerce as a basis for commerce regulation. Uh, can I, just one quick am amendment um, uh, on, the, on the Chief uh, Justice's uh, hapless toad reference uh, when he was a judge on the D.C. Circuit. It occurred in voting for rehearing on Bonk. Uh, he expressed no view on the merits. Uh, of whether or not it violated. He did call the toad hapless. He did which call the toad hapless, which some of us thought was funny. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I, and I, I meant to say that. It was a dissent from denial of free hearing and bonk. But it, in opinion, didn't actually refer to whether right. it would be constitutional. Right. Uh, the other he just thing said is, it was an important little, issue to decide. I'm a little less, uh, I wish I shared all of Don's confidence the court won't take the case uh, and how the court would rule on it. Um, ever since the court decided Lopez uh, in 1995, uh, when that case came down, all of us thought of two things immediately, wetlands and endangered species. Right. We knew Section 404 was in trouble, and we knew Section 7 was in trouble. The court has addressed it in the 404 context, Water Act. Uh, they haven't yet uh, done it in the Section 7 context. Um, there, as Don said, there's no conflict in the circuits, but every one of those cases has a very significant, loud, vocal dissent. Uh, and there's no coherent rationale between all the circuits that have addressed it. Every circuit has a different rationale uh, for why uh, it's okay. Uh, and their justice is interested in it. In the Rage case, the medical marijuana case during an oral argument, Justice Scalia raised the Endangered Species Act <laughs> in that argument. 
The case had nothing to do with the Endangered Species Act. And he starts talking about the Endangered Species Act in the middle of the medical marijuana uh, case. Uh, so there's some justices looking for a case on it. If, if this had been decided a few years ago, I'd have been very confident the government would win, completely win. They would have had Stevens, O'Connor, uh, Souter, uh, Breyer, and Ginsburg. Easy win. Uh, no problem. O'Connor been a reliable vote on this issue. We've lost Stevens, O'Connor, and Souter. It's a different court. Now it's all up to Kennedy on this issue. And that's always uh, sort of a precarious uh, read to rely upon. On that optimistic note. <laughs> all right, do we have questions from the uh, uh, audience uh, at all? And while you're thinking about that, um, I wanted to ask Jody a question uh, from the beginning. In AEP, you said it was 8-0, but there was a concurring decision. Uh, what, what in the world was that there, about? There was a rather churlish, I'll take 10 seconds on this, a little churlish concurrence by uh, Justices Alito and Thomas who pointed out that they were concurring in the uh, decision only because nobody had argued that Mass versus EPA huh. was in fact wrong. Uh, so they, they were ha would have been happy to relitigate Mass versus EPA. So is there a relationship between that and the hapless toad? I have no comment on that. <laughs> Don, we have been talking about preemption and displacement, but are those interchangeable words or are, 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 is there a difference? How does that work now? How do, how, what do we do with preemption after AEP and the argument, oral argument in AEP? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that they are identical uh, at, at all. Um, and I think that the court tried very hard in AEP to uh, create some logical space between, between the two, uh, which Jody summarized. But one of the things that Richard has taught me over the years uh, is to count, count the votes in the Supreme Court, not just read the opinions. Uh, and I think it's very significant that, um, uh, that, that certainly Justice Thomas, in a number of cases, has expressed a, a, a very strong opinion in terms of judicial restraint that the court ought not be interpreting uh, statutes easily uh, as to impliedly preempt uh, state level regulation because this is inconsistent with his, with his view uh, of the judicial role. So I think there are a number of quote conservative um, uh, justices who are uh, not, not certain votes uh, for these uh, federal preemption claims. And then at the same time, there's a, there's a justice on the other side who c tends to kind of like preemption of tort law, and that's Justice Breyer. Right, uh, right. Um, but but only, if, only if agencies have specifically addressed it through their, through their interpretive rulemaking powers. So uh, I just, do, I think that the, the, the test for uh, displacement of federal common law is a much less demanding test than the test for preemption of state level regulation. And I think that's why the Supreme Court went out of its way to use a different word uh, that wants to create a different legal concept. I think on the merits though, the same arguments that militate in favor of displacement are, get deployed. Uh, you know, judicial unmanageability, uh, the sort of unpredictability of the defendant class, uh, um, the nature of the harm, at least in the global warming context, such that this is really something that's not appropriate for courts. And I think those the very same rationale for finding displacement would favor finding preemption. In fact, Sotomayor on the Second Circuit in the panel, in the hearing uh, in the lower court on AEP, uh, was particularly focused on asking counsel for a path forward that would allow her to find displacement without finding preemption. Uh, and, it, and he said, I have five minutes to make this sale. And she said, yeah, you do. And uh, we'll never know if uh, she was sold. All right, so Richard, a question for you, and that is with the, the dean was kind enough to start this panel going. But of course, at Department of Justice, I inherited your last dean. Uh, 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 and she did quite well for herself, both as a solicitor general and then went on to other things. Uh, but she had to recuse herself from, of course, a number of cases last term. What, 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 how was she doing, Richard? Uh, uh, and what, do you, what role do you see this, uh, her playing now in the next term, more? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, Justice Kagan had, a, uh, I think, a, a pretty terrific first year. Um, um, she is an enormously talented person, but this was a big, a big leap. She had never been a judge uh, before. Uh, she hadn't been a practicing lawyer uh, very much either. She was mostly uh, an academic, uh, and she leapt right in. She had a very uh, 
a very successful year, successful year at Argonne, successful year in opinion. She recused himself from a lot of cases, like 40 or 45 uh, cases, but nonetheless had a pretty uh, regular diet of opinions, both opinions for the court and opinions for herself. Uh, I think people are waiting to see. She voted this first year. I don't think there are any major surprises during the first year, and there usually aren't major surprises for a justice uh, during their first year. Uh, I think in the longer term, uh, I think she's going to be someone who I think people believe and I expect will be pretty uh, much a, a defender of executive branch uh, authority, uh, whichever the administration. I have another question for Richard by way of closing, John, if you, may, if you will allow me. And that is just because of your perspective on the court and your perspective on environmental law over all these years, how do you position the upcoming term in terms of relative significance and importance? We're talking about this theme Don mentioned about preemption. How, how do you... So, f so far, uh, it's not that significant a uh, term for the court. The court has had several terms of enormously significant cases uh, where they've had like five, six, in some cases up to nine cases out of 80 will be environmental cases. Last term there was really one and then the original action case. Uh, this term there's, there's one uh, and the uh, uh, state title. Uh, there's not a lot. I think generally for the environmental community, that's good news. And uh, the, the less the court uh, takes these cases, uh, usually the better. And just to add a footnote to that, um, what's conspicuous by its absence is a significant standing case in the environmental area. For many, many years, when Richard and I have talked about this, we've been dealing with the Lujan and the, and the standing issues. And uh, uh, it's significant to me that they seem to have reached a pretty stable approach on that. And we don't have, at least that I know of at this point, a significant standing case on their docket. So maybe next year, if we're here, uh, what we'll actually be talking about is greenhouse gas cases. Uh, uh, right now, the, every major one of the EPA rules have been <laughs> contested. The endangerment finding, the light truck rule, the so-called tailoring rule, all of them had contested. All the briefing is going on. I expect it to be done by the end of this year. I expect that there will be a huge one-day argument, the court has said, in the D.C. ceremonial courtroom since it holds the most people about February. That means by May or June of next year, we'll have another significant, very significant series of decisions. I would like to have a round of applause by an extraordinary panel on Supreme Court actions, please. Thank you.